appreciate that. I haven't done anything yet. It's <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate you all coming out. Uh, so the title of my talk is Concurrent Exercise Training and Muscle Hypertrophy. And so uh, I'll jump right in here in a sec, but this is a topic that's sort of near and dear to me for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of which is I like to exercise, I always have. And I've always kind of trained concurrently. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more what that means. So I have a personal interest in it, but also my research interest has aligned with this as well. And so my head's kind of been here for a little while. And um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to come here and talk to you about this because I think what I'm going to talk about today is uh, perhaps a little bit of a paradigm shift in some respects. And so hopefully uh, you guys will find it interesting and won't call my bluff, but maybe you will. And that's great too. We can talk about that. But uh, quickly before I dive in too deep, uh, just a quick about me, where I'm from. I'm not just some guy off the street. Uh, well, actually, I went to my undergraduate at UNC Chapel Hill, where I got my bachelor's degree in exercise and sports science. And then I went on and did my master's degree in exercise physiology at James Madison University, which is uh, up in Virginia. And then from there, I bounced over to uh, Ball State University, where I got my PhD in human bioenergetics. And I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Bagley and his lovely wife. And um, my project, my dissertation project, was actually a collaboration with NASA, and it was a concurrent training study, actually trying to figure out the, uh, the best exercise prescription for astronauts when they go to space. Uh, when you go to space, your muscles kind of have an issue where they atrophy, so we're trying to figure out the really optimal exercise prescription to help prevent that from happening. I would have loved to present data from my dissertation. This is very much in line with what I'm gonna talk about today, but um, just the nature of NASA projects and the study not being published yet, I uh, just finished it up, so. Uh, I'm not going to present any of those data, but that's something I can talk to you guys about offline if that's something you're interested in. But uh, so yeah, I did my PhD and graduated in June, last June, and then right after that I went straight to the University of Kentucky and I started a postdoc in muscle stem cell biology. And so I'll talk a little bit today about muscle stem cells and, and what those mean. I won't get too deep into that, but, um, but that's what I'm studying right now. And so I came all the way from Kentucky, so thank you for the invite. Um, so. Let's start off uh, just by defining what is concurrent <coughs> exercise? What does this actually mean? So concurrent exercise, which I'll abbreviate as CE or AE plus RE throughout the course of the presentation, is the combination of endurance and resistance exercise within the same training program. And so it's actually a very practical model of training that a lot of people employ. In fact, uh, the American College of Sports Medicine and the ACSM, which is uh, the governing body for exercise physiologists, um, they define uh, an appropriate exercise program for health and wellness as a, a program of regular exercise that includes cardiorespiratory, resistance, flexibility, and neuromuscular exercise training beyond activities of daily living. But what you notice is that these two things are in there together, cardiorespiratory and resistance exercise training together for general health and wellness. So this is the ACSM's recommendation actually, is more or less concurrent exercise training, doing both these things in the same program. But um, if anybody in here has ever taken uh, an, exer an exercise programming or a training programming type class, you're perhaps familiar with the SED principle, the specific adaptations to impose demands principle, which stipulates that the optimal adaptation to a given exercise type is only realized by mode specific training. And so what that more or less means is if I wanted to be good at running a marathon, I would train by running. If I wanted to be good at power exercise, I would only do power exercise or strength, I would only do strength. So that's kind of what the, the said principle stipulates, and that's, uh, it holds water. That's, there, that's a very valid thing. But um, today I'm gonna kind of flip it on its head a little bit, as you'll see, but, um, but yeah, that's a very valid thing. And so, but we gotta have these competing things though, where if you wanna be, have general health and wellness, you should do both. But if you wanna really maximize one mode of exercise, you should only do that. And so, um, and before I go too far down the rabbit hole, so to say, and then getting into this topic of what happens when you combine the two modes together, uh, especially as it relates to whole muscle hypertrophy, I just wanna kinda throw a disclaimer out there. I'm gonna, I'll give you a hypothetical. So let's say that <coughs> I saw Phil Heath. He came to San Francisco State and he missed my lecture. So he says, hey Kevin, sorry I missed your talk. How do I get more gains? And of course I respond by saying, hey Phil, you're looking pretty small. You should train for a marathon. Not what I'm saying, all right? That is not, I just want to just throw that out there. I don't want anybody walking away with this like misconstrued perception of what I'm trying to say to you guys. 
And so um, that, that's an extreme example. This picture I, I put up there, uh, that was the first time I went to In-N-Out Burger. I was pumped. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, Jimmy took this picture. We were driving back across America, and we stopped in Las Vegas, and uh, he took me to an out burger, and it changed my life. So, a little moment with Jimmy and I. And, and, and so, um, but what I am really saying is something more along these lines: is you know, Phil Heath runs into me, hey Kevin, I'm worried about my heart health. Could I endurance train and still have gains? Because I'm sure he would, he would say that to me. And then um, I would say, sure, Phil, within reason. And so I'm going to kind of unpack this whole within reason idea um, because it's become uh, fairly, I guess, axiomatic. It's become really well accepted in the literature, at least, that if you want to have muscle size gains, if you want to get bigger, um, you should not endurance train. That would be like completely counteractive. And this, is, this idea has become really pervasive in the literature over the last like 30, 40 years where if you talk to any researcher that in our field, they would more than likely say, oh yeah, you shouldn't do that. Don't combine the two together, that's bad. You can't get enough muscle gains if you do aerobic exercise. And there's a variety of reasons for why that logic is still pervasive. And I will go through that here shortly. But um, really where this kind of began in the literature though, was uh, with this one study by Robert Hickson in 1980. So uh, he conducted a study where he wanted to kind of look at the, the effects of combining two different modes of exercise and what that actually does for adaptation in each individual mode. And so we designed this really elegant study, and this study has been cited, I think I checked the other day, 580 some odd times, almost 600 times. Pretty much any study that has ever talked about concurrent exercise training, the first paragraph or the first line of the paragraph is, Robert Hickson in 1980 said blah, 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 and then they go on to talk about you know, whatever the study's about. But it always begins here. Because in the literature, this was like the genesis of the idea that you should not combine training modes to maximize growth. And so um, what did he do? What, what was the, the crux of this study? So we had three groups, right? He had one group of people come in, and they just did strength training, OK? So they did three days a week of heavy leg exercise. So squats, knee extensions, leg presses, deadlifts. And it was heavy. It was like maximal every time. They did that three days a week, which that's that's stout, you know, like if anybody who's in here and trains knows that doing three days a week of all out leg exercise, that's no joke. Um, and then he had another group come in, several group of people, they endurance trained, okay? They did six days a week of cycling or running, intervals or continuous, so he mixed it all up, some days was running, some was cycling, doing all types of different things, but a really stout aerobic stimulus for a minimum of 30 minutes a day. So that was the first two groups, resistance and endurance. Then he had a third group the concurrent group, where he put both of those together. So the concurrent group did this and then rolled right into doing this. And that was for the course of 10 weeks. All right, and so like, if you've ever done either of those things separately, you know that that's, that's a lot. When you put them together, that's like a whole lot of training. And so, but he really wanted to start trying to see what happens on an extreme level. Like what happens if we do a ton of both? Is there gonna be a negative effect on either training mode as far as the adaptation goes? That's, that's kind of what he's trying to get at. And so um, I pulled this right out, of his, uh, right out of his paper. So on the y-axis here is cycling work. So essentially, uh, how well did they respond to the aerobic training, more or less? And so this top line here is how much work you're able to do on the bike over the duration of the training period. So this top line here is how the endurance people responded, so just the people who didn't endurance exercise. And as you might expect, you know, their endurance exercise capacity improved. That's great. And in the strength and endurance group, actually, basically the same. This is not different at all. This is like almost exactly the same adaptation. And so you can conclude from this first part of the study that, okay, if you add strength exercise to endurance exercise in a training program, it's probably not gonna have a negative effect on your endurance training. So that's, that's really great, that's good to know. And it sort of flies in the face a little bit of that set principle I was talking about. So you can combine these modes and it's not gonna have a negative effect on your endurance. Cool. So, but then we look at this, this is the strength adaptations, right? So on the, um, the y-axis here, we have how much strength they gained throughout the, uh, the 10 weeks of training. And this top line here is just the strength training group, right? So over the entire duration of the 10 week study, their strength just went up and up and up. They just kept gaining, which is great. That's what you wanna see. This line right here is the strength and endurance or the concurrent exercise training group. What they found is that at this first interval here, about the first seven weeks, their strength went up and up and up as well. 
And you'll know that they start in different places, but the slope of the line is more or less the same. So they had similar gains when they did concurrent exercise training up to about seven weeks, at which point strength actually started tailing off and going down. And so it was from this study, this original finding, really this figure right here, this seminal figure, where people started saying, okay, you can combine training when you're endurance training, no worries. But if you're trying to maximize your strength training adaptations, you should not include endurance training with your resistance training. That's, this figure is where it came from, really. And um, in the endurance training group, they weren't really getting strength. That kind of makes sense. They weren't doing strength training. And so, um, so that's where this idea came from. But the thing is, though, every time the study is cited, I would have to say probably 50% of the time it's not cited correctly. Because usually this study is cited within the context of hypertrophy. Naturally, when you resistance train, one of the main goals of resistance training is to gain muscle mass, correct? You want to get bigger and you want to get stronger. And the strength and the size kind of go hand in hand in some capacity. But this always gets cited as if you want to gain mass, don't do endurance exercise. Cite the Hickson study. And it doesn't show that. They didn't actually do a whole muscle measure like with an MRI or anything. It's just the strength went down. And in fact, the one size measure that they did, which is a very crude measure of muscle size, didn't show any different. They basically did leg circumference, and the strength group and the strength and endurance group had the identical gain in leg size from a leg circumference perspective. And so, and like nobody ever talks about that. That's like buried in the paper, but nobody notices it and nobody cites it either. But it's there, it's the data's in the paper. And it kind of got me thinking, like, why? why? Why has this become so pervasive? Why have people kept saying that you can't do these things when this original paper doesn't even show that, per se? Sure, the fact that strength goes, when it goes down at the end, that might translate to less gains down the road. But honestly, look at the training. I would bet that they were just overtraining. They were just tired, you know, by the end of this. And they just didn't want to lift anymore. And so, um, so yeah. So this idea is where it came from, but the paper is usually miscited within the context of concurrent training and muscle size. Regardless of that, um, people have, since this time, conducted tons and tons of studies trying to uncover the mechanism by which endurance exercise training interferes with adaptations to resistance training. And there are tons of studies on this topic, right? Because that's just what people want to do now. We need to find a mechanism for everything, right? We need to find the answer. And now in the world of exercise physiology, we have all these crazy molecular techniques and we do all types of fun stuff to try and figure out the exact mechanism, the exact protein or whatever that's causing the interference effect with concurrent exercise, right? And so I'm just gonna give you a very quick, quick and dirty overview of molecular adaptations to exercise, okay? So um, let's say that I go and do a resistance exercise bout at the gym, right? And that stimulus on the muscle, and this is the muscle fiber, and the picture is courtesy of Dr. Bagley, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, that, that's a muscle fiber that he took a picture of on a confocal microscope. And these little blue dots here, those are myonuclei. Those are the, uh, the molecular masterminds of the cell, so to say, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. But uh, muscle cells are multinucleated. They have tons of nuclei, and that's a very unique thing in the body. Not many cells are multinucleated. One reason why muscle is so special. But um, so I go to the gym, I do a resistance exercise bout. And so the stimulus on the muscle is more or less load and tension. That's what the muscle is perceiving, load and tension when you go to do a resistance exercise bout. And so uh, now we're gonna pretend like we're going into the muscle now. This is the, the, uh, the sarcolemma, this is the muscle membrane. So now we're in the muscle cell. We have this load and tension stimulus. What happens is there's this one protein complex in the muscle that gets activated with resistance exercise. And it's called mTOR. And we don't have to worry about what that stands for, but it's a, it's a very popularly studied thing. And we know that when you resistance exercise, mTOR gets upregulated. mTOR activity goes way up. Essentially, it gets phosphorylated, so to say. So the mTOR activity goes way up. After you have mTOR activation, after resistance exercise, essentially what happens is it turns on ribosomes. And if you remember from biology, a ribosome is essentially the thing that makes proteins, right? So we have the activation of mTOR, and then we turn on the machinery to start making proteins in the muscle so that we can start growing. And so, the machinery is turned on, and because there's all this uh, myosin or myofibrillar or muscle protein just hanging around or muscle transcript hanging around, that gets translated into actual proteins at a, very, at a higher rate, and that ultimately leads to muscle fiber growth. And that's just a very brief overview of what happens. There's like a million other steps involved in this. But ultimately what you have is protein added to the fiber, 
so that it can then grow and become stronger. That's how, kind of how adaptation occurs. So that's how it goes down with resistance exercise, right? So let's say we do endurance exercise instead. I go to the gym and I decide to sit on the bike for an hour. That stimulus is going to be more of an energetic and metabolic type of stress, right? So we're going to be burning through energy at a pretty high rate, and that's going to be what's really stressing the muscle. So we go into the muscle fiber now. What happens with this type of stimulus is instead of activating mTOR, we activate something called AMPK, which is what's called the energy sensor of the cell. So you're burning through all this energy, you're using ATP, which is like the energy currency of the cell, you have to have ATP to live. So you start burning through ATP, you're using energy, and this little uh, molecule here gets activated, right? In order to basically try and spare ATP from getting completely depleted. And then what also happens though, is you activate this AMPK, what happens is we have mitochondrial gene transcription. So essentially this signal will then signal the nucleus to start spitting things out that relate to building more mitochondria, which is a good thing because that means the next time that you go and do an exercise bout and you build more mitochondria, you'll have a greater capacity to deal with this energetic stress because the mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, right? So we have this mitochondrial gene tra transcription that ultimately results in mitochondrial biogenesis, which is a classic adaptation to endurance exercise. So if you do endurance exercise, you build more mitochondria, you build bigger mitochondria, you can have more, you're able to use energy better. And that's a good thing for endurance exercise. But what's actually been shown in a variety of experimental models, namely in animal models, where you can manipulate the system a little more readily, um, it's been shown that when you upregulate this first thing that happens here, this AMPK, that actually blunts or eliminates mTOR from being activated within these experimental models. So theoretically, if you combine this and this, and you activate AMPK, it'll stop the growth from happening. And like I said, this has been shown in some very specific experimental models. That process, from a, from a global perspective, holds up. It's, it, that's a real thing. It does, we can make that happen, at least in animal models and cell culture models and things of that nature on a very small scale. And so that's real. But that has really kind of also become pervasive in the literature, right? This idea that you can't have growth because there's this molecular mechanism that exists that prevents it from happening. And there's been tons and tons of papers on this too. And there are some studies that were done in the early 2000s that have been cited hundreds of times as well, where that's just dogma. That's just, that's what it is. It's like everyone accepts it now, that's cool. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of a basic overview of molecular adaptations to exercise. And so, where's the evidence for this in humans though, is the real question. Because the fact of the matter is, you can do all these things in animals, you can do all these things in cell culture, uh, you can do all these experiments that will show what you want to show, but how does it actually translate to real human models? How does it translate to what happens in a person who's exercising? And that's what I'm interested in. And so, some human studies actually do report inhibition of growth processes when you do concurrent exercise training, at least from a very acute perspective. If you put endurance exercise and resistance exercise in close proximity to each other, like for a single bout, there's some evidence to show that, okay, these processes might be competing in humans as well. That's a possibility. But there are others that, other studies that report literally the exact opposite. And there's actually been studies, a number of them, that have shown the mTOR signaling, the mTOR growth pathway, actually is upregulated when you add endurance to resistance exercise, which is like completely the opposite of what you'd expect. And I just pulled one example from the literature because I thought it was a, a pretty good study. Um, there's a study in 2015 where they had people come in and do an acute bout of resistance exercise, four by eight uh, reps of leg extension at 70 percent one RM, pretty standard. And then they had them come back and do resistance exercise, the same thing combined with aerobic exercise. Essentially did 10 minutes of really high intensity cycling right before doing the resistance exercise, right? And that, the idea there being that if we're gonna do a bunch of really intense cycling, that should exacerbate, that should increase this signal for interference where you shouldn't have that growth process happening anymore. Because we, we have this energetic stimulus going on that the muscle more or less takes care of that as opposed to worrying about growth, right? And on the y-axis here, we have mTOR phosphorylation. The, uh, the white bars are what happen with resistance exercise, and the black bars would happen when you combine the two modes together. You'll see that when you combine the two modes together, that growth process, that mTOR signaling, is upregulated with aerobic and resistance exercise across the board, across you know six hour time points. And so it's completely counter to what I've been telling you already. 
And so really, even in response to acute exercise where this type of stuff should be happening, it's not always the case. So it's kind of, it's confusing. And so, so that's confusing. Um, I'm gonna confuse you further now. And so, uh, when I was getting my master's degree, and this, is, this study here that we did, this is really what kind of got me thinking about this on a more research level, and kind of in some ways what drove me into what I'm doing now, is kind of like helped shape where my career has gone and where it's hopefully going. Um, we did this study back in 2012, looking at something called satellite cells, which are, um, that's my area of study now. I, I study muscle satellite, muscle stem cells, satellite cells. But essentially, um, this is a muscle cross section here. So if I took a little biopsy from you and then cut it up, I'd be able to look at your muscle fibers and kind of see, measure a bunch of different things. But um, muscle's a really unique tissue in the sense that you have these little cells called satellite cells that hang out on the outside of your muscle fibers, right? And when you do exercise, those little stem cells is what they are. They get activated and they start doing things in the muscle to help it to grow or help it to adapt. And that's uh, an area of research that I'm personally really interested in, right? But it's been shown in a variety of experimental models that the more of these stem cells you have in your muscle, the more you're able to grow, okay? And that's been shown in humans, and there's some different evidence in mice than we can talk about at a different time. But in humans, it's been shown that the more of these stem cells you have within your muscle, the more you can grow. And so we hypothesized back in 2012 that perhaps if you combine aerobic and resistance exercise it prevents these satellite cells from doing what they're supposed to do. It prevents these muscle stem cells from doing the different growth processes that help you to grow. So that was kind of the basis for our hypothesis because the mTOR stuff was kind of like shaky. And so like, okay, maybe there is some other mechanism by which aerobic exercise interferes with resistance exercise as from a growth perspective. And so we started looking into this. And uh, we did a study where we took uh, people, the same group of people, we just had them come in multiple times, the first time they came in, we had them do resistance exercise. So standard stuff, four sets by greater than 10 repetitions, leg extensions, and leg presses. Then we had them come in again. We had them do aerobic exercise, 90 minutes of cycling at 60% VO2 max. And these people were untrained, and so that was like really hard. That's not, that's not an easy thing to do. And then uh, the third time we had them come in, we wanted to get a look at this interference effect, right? So we had them do the aerobic exercise and then immediately jump on, or we had them actually do the resistance exercise and then immediately jump on the bike and do the aerobic exercise. With the idea that if we do these two things in really close proximity, we take these two stimuli, that they're gonna interfere with one another and something's gonna happen with these satellite cells that would inhibit growth, okay? So this is what we found. So on the y-axis, we have uh, satellite cell density, so the number of satellite cells that you get after resistance exercise, and the slow twitch fibers actually increase by about 45%, which is what you'd expect. If you do a resistance exercise bout, it's been shown time and time again in the literature, you increase the number of satellite cells that you have. Because a resistance exercise bout is a growth stimulus. So you sort of expect different growth processes to come on board, such as satellite cells. So this didn't surprise us, that's cool. With the endurance exercise bout, found that actually satellite cells didn't really do anything at all, which didn't necessarily surprise us as much either. Um, I'll present some evidence related to that in the next slide, but for now, that's fine. We're like, okay, satellite cells aren't doing anything with, with endurance exercise. Okay, so what happens when we combine the two? Nothing. So it looked to us like, at least our original interpretation was, okay, so if we combine the endurance exercise with the resistance exercise, it more or less blunts the growth response in the stem cells, which, you know, if you extrapolate that out to training over six, eight months or whatever, okay, well that might actually lead to interference. That might actually be a mechanism by which muscle can't grow when you combine the two modes. So that was a study we did in 2012. As soon as I got to Kentucky, I had the opportunity to be part of this other study, which is sort of related to this. And um, I'll try to frame it for you as best I can. But um, essentially the question we had though was we wanted to understand how does endurance training affect the satellite cell response to just resistance exercise? So I show that if you just do a bout of resistance exercise, the stem cells increase, that should promote growth. But what happens if you're really well trained from an endurance perspective? Will that blunt the amount of growth that you have or the growth response from acute resistance exercise? We were kind of interested in this question. So we had people come in and we had them do, we, had, we took a baseline biopsy, so we took some muscle out of their leg and then we had them do a resistance exercise bout, and then three days later, we took muscle out of their legs again, so we could look to see if the satellite cells increased. And then we had them endurance trained for 12 weeks. 
So we got them real nice and trained up. And then we have them come back and do the exact same thing. They came in, we took a muscle sample out of their leg, had them do resistance exercise, then took another muscle sample. With the idea that we're gonna look and see how many muscle stem cells increased the first time versus did it increase after endurance training as well. And the thought being, maybe after your endurance trained, you don't have that, set, that stem cell response anymore. And maybe you lose that, and maybe like an endurance trained muscle won't grow as much. That was the thought we had. And so, I'm gonna show you the endurance trained data first. So on the y-axis here, we have the number, number of muscle stem cells, and on the x-axis, we have the different training conditions. So, when we did the resistance exercise bout after you endurance trained, satellite cells didn't go up at all. And we were like, okay, well that could be, you know, that might be an interference thing. It might be when you endurance train, you just can't have that stem cell response anymore. Maybe you won't grow as much. What was interesting though, is that in the untrained state, you had an increase in satellite cells, sure, like we'd expect with resistance exercise, but the level, the overall levels after endurance training were already higher than what you had just in response to the acute exercise. So it kind of flips it on its head. It's almost as if when you're endurance trained, you don't need to have the stem cell response anymore. You've already had it. The endurance training almost like primed you for growth, at least from a stem cell perspective. And so this is kind of interesting. And we were like, okay. Um, we didn't mess, measure whole muscle size in this study, though. Okay, so we didn't. We, we had this endurance training bout, but we didn't. This endurance training of 12 weeks, but we didn't measure whole muscle size. So, I guess the question now becomes: Can endurance training in and of itself cause muscle growth? Which is a really interesting question. And there's actually been a lot of studies that have shown endurance training by itself, without resistance training, causes pretty significant muscle growth, at least in untrained people. So on the y-axis, we have the size of the quadriceps, which is your thigh muscle here. And um, on the x-axis, I have a couple different studies that I dug up from the literature. And you'll see that with three days a week of cycling over 10 weeks, you could grow your muscle by as little as 3%. But if you cycle train for 12 weeks, or even for a shorter time, six weeks, you can have muscle growth in your thighs of as high as 7%, which is like, almost as much as you would get with resistance exercise alone over that time frame. And so, it's actually interesting in the literature, endurance training by itself can be hypertrophic. So it's kind of confusing, like why, why is this idea that if you combine endurance and resistance training together bad for growth, when endurance training just by itself clearly causes growth? And so, that really got us thinking about what does the literature really say about concurrent training? Like, is this a real thing? Is it true that you can, you, if you combine aerobic and resistance exercise that you blunt growth, is that a real thing? Because I don't buy it. If the endurance training by itself causes growth, I don't buy it. And so, Jimmy and I then went through the literature and uh, more or less found every study that has ever looked at whole muscle growth with concurrent exercise training. And so, I just talked about the Hickson study already that gets cited all the time as like, you can't grow if you have aerobic and resistance training together. I really wanted to know the answer. So we went and found every study that ever looked at this. And every study that looked at this, um, I had to make sure that they had enough subjects. So we, all these studies have at least eight people in, this, in, this, in the groups. And we also wanted to look at muscle size and make sure it was an accurate measure of muscle size. So all the studies that I'm about to show you, they measured muscle size either by MRI or by CT scan which is highly accurate. We're not talking about you know, doing leg circumference or anything like that. We're talking about highly sensitive measures of muscle size, okay? And so, on the y-axis here, we again have quadriceps hypertrophy. So we have uh, muscle growth of the thigh, which those are the muscles you're exercising. If you're doing leg strengthening and if you're doing cycling, that's the muscle that's getting hit. So if there is gonna be interference, it'll be in your quadriceps, right? And so we have quadriceps growth on the y-axis, and we have all the different studies that we were able to dig up on the x-axis, okay? And we, um, we titrated it out by how much time was in between the exercise bout, so in between the aerobic exercise and the resistance exercise throughout the training. Because the, the idea is, if we're gonna have an interference effect, if these two aer aerobic and resistance exercise modes are going to have a negative effect on one another, it's probably gonna happen when you're doing them really close in proximity, when there's no time to recover, right? And so we titrated out by how much time was in between the two modes throughout the course of the training. And so this is what we found. <coughs> Basically, uh, with concurrent exercise training, not a single study in close proximity 
concurrent exercise training has shown blunted growth of a hypertrophy. Not a single study we could find. In fact, one study showed significantly more growth when you combine aerobic and resistance exercise training together. So that was kind of baffling. It's like, okay. I was like, surely there are some studies out there where there's actually shown blunted growth with concurrent training. The answer is no. And if it's out there, I haven't seen it, and I'll probably be the one to find it. And so if you're aware of a study, please tell me about it, because I, I haven't seen it. And so, um, so that was interesting. And then if you divide, or if you space out the aerobic and resistance exercise within the training program by six hours or more, so let's say you come in, you aerobic train one day, and then the next day you resistance train, it's almost unanimously more growth with concurrent training. So the whole idea that muscle growth or that aerobic training and resistance training are not complementary for muscle growth, there's no evidence. At least in the literature, from a whole muscle perspective, if I'm measuring your whole thigh, there's, there's no evidence for it. And we've been talking about this and we've been saying that this is what's happening since 1980. And so we just published a study in uh, sports medicine. It's available online. I'm sure if you want it, Jimmy will give it to you. But um, yeah, so that really, uh, that really got us thinking about this differently. And so that was exciting, though, for us. And uh, it just, it just kind of goes to show, though, that it's really easy to ascribe something to a single study. And you really need to look at the global perspective. You need to look at all the literature. You need to read as much as you can to really understand what's happening. Because most people, even now, when you ask them, they'll say, don't do the two together. But it seems that within at least the parameters of these studies, it kind of seems OK. So and I'd be remiss if I didn't at least bring this study up. This study just got um, published a couple weeks ago. Um, and they, it was a concurrent exercise training study. Uh, it's in plus one. And, it was a, and essentially what they did was similar to all the other studies. They had a group of people come in and do resistance exercise training, pretty standard resistance exercise training, and then had another group do concurrent exercise training. So the same thing. They did um, the resistance exercise that the other people did, immediately followed by con continuous and interval cycling. So same type deal, same thing I've been talking about. Um, like I said, this was just published. And so um, on the y-axis, they looked at percent fiber CSA. So we're not talking about whole muscle size anymore. We're talking about size of the single fibers. So they took muscle biopsy samples pre and post and looked at the size of the actual fibers in this study. And then we have the two, uh, the two groups, the resistance and the concurrent group. The resistance group, they're fast twitch fibers group, which, you, which you'd expect. Um, type 1 fibers the slow twitch fibers didn't grow as much. But the concurrent group, way more growth, way more growth. And so it was just another piece of evidence. Like this literally came out right as our study came out, right as our paper came out. And I didn't get to cite this. But um, again, just more evidence kind of piled on top of what I've already been talking to you about. And it's just like, it's like the snowball effect. People just keep looking at it. And I think it's finally people are just starting to see that, OK, I think we need to think about this differently. And so I guess let's, let's be a little more practical now. Let's talk about practical considerations now. If you're actually interested in gaining muscle mass, but you want to do aerobic exercise as well, you care about your heart health, and uh, you, or you enjoy aerobic exercise, but you want to put on muscle mass, what's the best way to go about doing that? How can, how can we really assimilate all this information and have like a nice package so that you can leave here and understand what maybe is the best thing to do? And so um, I'll just start by showing you what generally characterizes the studies that showed more growth with, con with concurrent training. So the studies that have shown greater hypertrophy of concurrent exercise are generally characterized by a relatively low volume of training, okay? So usually you have two to three days of aerobic exercise, maybe include some high intensity interval type training because that will reduce the volume of exercise that you do because usually it's done quickly. And so two to three days of aerobic exercise, less than or equal to two days a week of resistance exercise. So if you remember in that Hickson study, you had people going three days a week, hard, heavy legs. I don't think you really need to do that. You can scale it back. That's probably gonna cause overtraining, to be honest. So you can scale that back, have a couple days a week, one to two days of resistance training, less than one hour session, again, consistent with the idea that you wanna keep your volume a little bit lower. And then, in general, about eight sets or so per session of leg resistance exercise. So those are the things that, the first thing that kind of characterizes those studies that have greater growth with concurrent training. The second thing, yeah, maybe you should separate your uh, aerobic and resistance exercise by six to 24 hours. That seems like a safe 
a safe recommendation um, for the reasons that you would avoid fatigue, right? Because if you do the, the two exercise modes right back to back, there's a chance that one of those exercise modes isn't going to be as high quality as it could be because you're tired. So if you just separate them out by a couple hours, six to 24 hours ideally, just do them on different days, should be fine. And if there is molecular interference going on, if this whole AMPK, mTOR thing really is messing with your gain, so to say, you kind of avoid that by separating it out by this period of time. So that's reasonable. And also it seems like cycling is a better mode than running for causing growth. And so um, it's been shown before that running may incur damage and this could increase recovery time. If you increase your recovery time, that means your subsequent training might not be as good. And so that seems less, ha less so happening with cycling exercise because it's more concentric than eccentric. Um, running is more of an eccentric type of a bout and so it could cause damage. Um, so it seems like cycling works a little bit better than running. Not only that, but all those slides I showed you about endurance training causing growth, cycling. Because a lot of times, cycling, if you are untrained especially, is kind of like resistance exercise. If you put the, if you put the watts up high enough, you know, that's kind of like a repeated you know, resistance exercise type stimulus. So it seems like that works a little bit better. It's more compatible with resistance training. So those are just some general recommendations from the literature. There are some other things I think you could probably consider. Um, again, mode, I think rowing is great. My whole dissertation was actually on the rower. And uh, we did a rowing study, it was really cool. I read a lot of rowing literature. I'm a big fan of rowing now. And actually just the other day, again, a colleague of Jimmy's just published a paper um, where they did concurrent exercise training with uh, rowing. So they had people on this uh, gravity independent uh, device where they did leg presses and also did or rowing and leg presses and actually showed that thigh growth over five weeks was 10%, which is actually, in the exercise literature, the second highest rate of growth reported. I'm talking in response to any exercise training ever done in the literature, second highest rate of growth reported. The first highest was another concurrent training study, which I already showed you the data for. So the highest rates of growth in the human exercise literature come from concurrent training. So again, just more evidence that you know this whole idea has kind of been a little bit muddled, in my opinion. Um, one thing you do need to be aware of, though, is that if you combine the two training modes, you might compromise your muscle performance. It's been shown that um, that velocity at um, high loads will decrease. That muscle power might be a little bit lower if you do concurrent exercise training. I believe those data. That's been showed quite a lot. Although recently, a study just came out yesterday that I just read this morning, did a concurrent exercise versus resistance show there was no change in power. And so like, or no difference in power after training. So it's still kind of a mixed bag, but there have been a lot of studies that show if you do concurrent training, you might compromise your muscle power a little bit. So if you're a really high level athlete and very interested in power, it's one of those instances where, okay, maybe you don't want to do as much concurrent exercise training. Maybe you want to do more mode specific type stuff. But um, that's, that's one disclaimer I will throw out there. But another thing I think is really important that doesn't get talked about enough is dietary considerations with concurrent exercise training. The fact of the matter is, if you're doing resistance exercise to gain mass, and then you add aerobic exercise in, you're increasing your volume of exercise, right? And you're naturally going to increase your caloric expenditure. And that's something that you need to kind of be cognizant of when you're doing your training. And so I had, um, there's a really nice study uh, in endurance athletes that I think kind of hits this point Pretty, pretty solidly, so I'll show you the data from that. And so uh, there's a couple studies in the literature, but this one specifically that stood out to me, where they actually did concurrent training in already highly trained athletes. So essentially what happened was they had two groups. We had an untrained group that did just a standard two days a week of leg strengthening resistance exercise, and then they had a, well, a group of really well-trained cyclists do that same resistance training, in addition to their training that already was occurring. So these guys were untrained, doing, weren't doing anything but resistance training. The well-trained cyclists, they were doing the resistance training added to 10 hours a week of high intensity, <coughs> high endurance cycling, okay? And so the, the white bars will be what happened before training and the red bars are what happened after. So what you notice is that the untrained people, their quads, their leg muscles grew 8% over the training. The cycling group, they only grew 4%. And so this is sort of like some evidence that, okay, you know, maybe if you're doing really, really high volumes of endurance training, you might not be able to grow as much. Maybe this, this is where the interference effect might actually be happening if you have really high volumes of endurance training, which sort of makes sense. But a couple things to point out. First of all, 
even though they weren't significantly different and they were the exact same size, the cyclists and the untrained people are the same size, same body mass index, they're very similar. The cyclists actually started off with slightly bigger thighs, which again is evidence of endurance exercise training, namely cycling, causing hypertrophy, right? If they're the same size, they have bigger legs. And so um, kind of evidence for that. And they ultimately ended in the same spot, okay? <laughs> So it could be attributed to the fact that they just had slightly bigger legs to begin with, but what I thought was the more compelling evidence in this study was that you had these two groups, and if you compared their diets, they had the exact same caloric intake. So the guys that were doing the additional 10 hours a week of endurance training had the same amount of protein and the same amount of calories as the untrained people. And so I think it's possible that these cycling guys, they maybe just weren't eating enough. There might have been even greater growth in this group had they just had enough calories, had enough protein on board. It's possible. I'm not saying that's what happened, but they did the dietary recall. They ate the same amount, allegedly. So kind of just goes to show that, you know, you need to be paying attention to your diet throughout this whole process as well. And that's kind of, diet's the hardest thing. Working out is easy. Diet is hard. And so um, that was interesting. But um, I want to end with just one, one study, one more study I want to share with you guys, because I, I think these findings are compelling and interesting and it's animal research which is what I do now so I feel remiss if I didn't at least mention something animal related while I was here. Um, and so there's this study that was done by Reggie Edgerton and uh, Roland Roy back in 1997. So I showed you the data from the 1980 Hickson study. That study has been cited 580 some odd times. This study which was done in um, rats has been, studied, has been cited 50 times since 1997. People like just don't pay attention to this study, and I don't know why, because it was a great study. But um, so essentially, what they did is they had these rats, right? And it's, it's hard to train animals, specifically mice and rats, because they don't care. They're mice and rats, and so they don't care. You know? And so, uh, so there's there's one strategy that you can use to cause muscle growth in a rat or a mouse, and it's, it's the surgery called a synergist ablation, right? And so um, this is a mouse or a rat hind limb, and essentially you have these two muscles on the hind limb that are responsible for plantar flexors. Think of them as a, a human calf. It's essentially a human calf, but uh, this is a mouse or a rat hind limb. So you have the plantaris underneath, you have the gastroc over the top of it. So uh, what we do actually, and I do the surgery all the time now because I do mouse stuff, and so um, we do the surgery now where essentially what you do is you go in, you just take the gastroc out. You just go in, you cut the muscle out, or you can cut a portion of it, or you can cut the tendon. But you just set it up so that the plantaris has to do all the work. So if you remove the synergist muscle, if you remove the muscle that has the same action, the muscle that's left that does the same action has to basically take up the slack and do everything. <clears throat> and that's exactly what happens. So we take out the gastrocnemius. It's called a synergist ablation. All that's left is the plantaris. And so if the mouse wants to walk around or get around in any way, it has to use its plantaris more or less exclusively. And so what that does is it causes the plantaris to grow immensely. And so uh, what Roy and Edgerton did was this study where they had two groups, or rather they had three groups, but they had, they had a group where they did the synergist ablation, which is supposed to just cause massive muscle growth of the plantaris. And then they had another group where they did the synergist ablation the same way, but then they also had them run five days a week at 10% grade. And so if you put a, a mouse or a rat on a treadmill, it'll, it'll run usually. And so it's actually a lot easier to endurance train a mouse or a rat than it is to cause growth. But um, so we had these two groups and this is kind of like an analog for concurrent training. You have just the regular overload model, but then you add in an intense endurance training stimulus over the top of it. And you'd maybe expect that if you added the intense endurance training stimulus over the top, if the interference effect is occurring, that maybe the group that did the running with the synergist ablation wouldn't grow as much. I think that's a reasonable hypothesis. That's what I probably would have expected. So these were the data. On the top figure here, we have just the synergist ablated, just the functionally overloaded mice. So after one week, they grew up to about 2,500 units. But after 10 weeks, they grew up to about 4,000, just on average. But if you take the functional overload plus the running, synergist ablation plus running, they grew to 3,000 after one week and grew to 5,000 after 10 weeks. So it was actually 20% greater growth adding the running to the synergist ablation. And again, this study, this study has only been cited like 50 times. It's been around since 1997. 
And so, like, the data has existed. There's been, like, at least indirectly. I'm not, I'll be the first to tell you this is not a perfect model, like, far from a perfect model. But it's at least evidence to show that you can have these two competing stimuli and still have growth. I would say at the very least, in most circumstances, it's not inhibiting growth, and it could be even helping it in some very specific circumstances. And so that's, uh, that's kind of what I got for you. So my summary and take homes, evidence for acute inter concurrent interference in humans is confusing. And at times, it's honestly contradictory. Evidence for growth interference at the cellular level, concurrent training is pretty limited, and it's more or less completely lacking at the whole muscle level, at least up to this point. And concurrent exercise within reason does not appear to blunt hypertrophy. And it may actually augment it. It may actually cause greater hypertrophy in certain circumstances within reason. So adequate rest, rest low volumes, 45 days a week, so frequency, limited running, eating enough, not overtraining. This is all basic stuff. This is all pretty basic stuff. But it seems like you can keep your gains. So. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. Really <laughs> so, this is a shawl. Shawl. Yeah. Um, so thank you guys all for coming. Um, it, we're going to have question and answer time now. If you can stick around, if not, again, thanks for coming. And again, big round of applause for Dr. Mayer.